24 dollars so i i have customers in kolkata but the uh, rate is exorbitant we need some a solution there also second is that there is no direct uh, sea service from karachi to mumbai and uh, in the future when you want to do the trade you know the, we, we don't have a direct you know we want at least one indian because you have more uh, lines than we have so uh, this is something that we have to think about and third one thing is missing on a, on a on a micro scale if i am allowed to if i do the uh, say some trade a suit which is called the suitcase or in form a small trade and i want to go to meet mr pradeep i can go in my own car and that is also transport and go and drop him and then he can take me to somewhere where we both can have fun you know thank you <laughs> fine would you like to respond and we we'll, acha we'll, we'll, we'll take the question from that table there aapka you you do yes thank you mr chair sanjay kathuria from the world bank so <clears throat> i just had a question for the panelists in terms of what the what they see as the possible low hanging fruits in in you know there is a obviously you, there is a very ambitious agenda in terms of seamless connectivity and going all the way from istanbul to chittagong and you know within south asia as well similar you know reviving the grand trunk road and so on but what is there i mean given the what the situation is in south asia can we propose some practical low hanging fruits which is implementable which does not arouse the uh, suspicions of the security agencies and whatever you know sort of the confidence building measures i mean could it be very small pilot routes that the you know that they could be laid out what are the lessons from already there is some element of connectivity between nepal india and bangladesh there is some you know some uh, some elements of connectivity do exist in terms of allowing uh, through traffic uh, are there any lessons to be learned from that so, so general question Thank you, sir. Uh, many of these problems that uh, we are discussing today about connectivity, particularly between India and Pakistan, and also taking from what Sanjay has just said, I think uh, a large part of this problem, problem areas, will be resolved if there is a multimodal transport facilitation agreement among the third countries. So, what I would like to know from you, sir, is the status of that agreement. and can we secondly can we have a pilot projects so just between lahore and amritsar uh, which can resolve many of these issues between india pakistan trade though at a in a limited manner but at least there will be a good beginning sir thank you my uh, question is for dr ahmed um actually until a few months ago i did not know that uh, pakistan was in the process of getting this tir accession and it was such a revelation that that's when i started digging so deep into it and i realized the lack of this on our eastern side so there are many things where our east can learn from the west and, and vice versa so this is one of the things that we need to uh, learn from you Uh, so we would like to know what were the challenges for you i mean i think you're still in the process of accession and if i'm not mistaken you started in 2009 and we're now in 2014 so i don't think the accession is complete yet am i right so what are the challenges uh, that you're facing because that would help us in thinking about it not just us actually the entire region should be thinking about joining the tir convention because the ultimate answer to connectivity is joining up with an international convention we we'll get two more questions Uh, thank you. My name is Yogesh Kumar. I'm a former ambassador. I just want to make one comment here in terms of the presentations made. Uh, I think it's very clear when we talk about these connectivity issues. There are two aspects to it. One is the security aspect, more so in the case of India-Pakistan apprehension about state-sponsored subversion of such uh, such links, such linkages, and political dimension. So, 
I think uh, in all these uh, sort of uh, agreements that we negotiate, I think we should actually have some you know, highly qualified security consultants who can actually look at this aspect and allay these apprehensions. That's one side. Political factor is easier in one way, that once you have the groundwork ready, once you have the political will, it can immediately be brought into effect straight away. Uh, in fact, uh, all these, the model about uh, regional railway and so on and so forth, this kind of network, these are actually perhaps a little more aspirational because at this particular moment, it's a bit of a chicken neck kind of situation that we cannot go into very large, high capita uh, capital intensive or long maturity kind of projects until we have, because they're economically unsustainable, until we actually have uh, these kind of, as people have already said about low-hanging fruits and actually analyze the existing trends and see how we can build on them. Thank you. <coughs> okay, last question. Uh, last and then we have the Well, thank you, Mahendra Lama. I teach in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, you know, I would feel that the regional model has been uh, a failure. The concept itself, as far as South Asia is concerned. Can you just keep the questions short? Yeah. We're running out of time. Yeah, because the studies were done in 1993 in South Asia by under the SARC Secretariat, and again in 2005. And I, we have increasingly realized why not we shift gradually or transform the entire process into sub-regional model. Pick up a sub-region, then start working on that more effectively and take it to the logical level instead of talking something very big at the regional level. Thank you. Uh, okay, two or three things. One, uh, low-hanging fruit. I think if we open one or two other routes, that, that would be a, qu a quick jump. That, that will give uh, more connectivity, increase in uh, But I, I, I think another, uh, there are two opportunities now. One is uh, the whole world is working on this trade facilitation agreement, and there's a lot of donor money is available and uh, technical, f and, and they are just doing it. So if both Pakistan and India can fully implement that. I think many, many of these, whatever uh, these uh, border agency cooperation within the country, all these things are covered there. And uh, I think we'll, that will make a big difference. And uh, the third thing, maybe there, there was a question that we can't, we can't have these big border uh, investments, etc. But already, for example, uh, there was a mention of uh, carrot corridors. Something like 17 to 20 billion dollars have already been invested by six uh, uh, donor agencies. It's coordinated by Asian uh, uh, this thing, and it just needs a little bit of extension here and there. So a lot of work has already been done. So that just needs uh, another big push and. Perhaps the, the problem is it, it gets stuck on the Pakistani side. And they have to think that, you know, if, they, if they're linking with Europe, etc., the Europeans would like to send their goods to India. It's, they're not just going to stop in Pakistan. Similarly, by all these Central Asian countries, they have to let this open up, and, 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 and that's the way. Well, is there anything else I could? And then this uh, services uh, liberalization about multi, I mean, they have to, this is already, the agreements have been signed and everything. It's just now uh, some bureaucrats and, and they're just, uh, you know, doing it. I know it's going to take time, but it can make a difference. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, first, I'll start with uh, the point raised on coordination between agencies. You're absolutely right, sir. Um, uh, um, I completely agree with you. Coordination at all levels is important. I just want to take a quick example from uh, the you know the po the experience from the policy dialogue that we had in November last year. We had uh, uh, members uh, representing um, Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan who are involved in the process of uh, facilitating ITI corridor, and they were saying that you know e after having putting everything in place and the containers started moving and the trains started flying. Um, uh, in all these countries, they could see uh, traders not using uh, the new facility and resorting to the earlier ones, even when the cost is much higher because they don't trust trust the trust the network. They say that you know we have established a relationship with the liner ships which we have been uh, you know using, and our containers will be our <coughs> goods will be safe. So they don't even trust. So the, it's it's this point of as a failure of 
marketing this corridor by all these countries together because it's a joint property it's not anymore iran's uh, corridor it, it not it's not turkey's corridor it's a corridor which is owned by all the three hosting countries so that joint marketing is one example where the coordination has failed now that may takes me to the question raised by majid sir uh, the 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 problem right now is that the uh, as we have seen with the current iti corridor is that the users has not come forward the usage rate is very low even now now once the usage rate goes up if we are able to implement it correctly build trust among the traders uh, you know encourage them to use it and they'll you know the learning by examples you know it will happen so usage rate goes up it's a simple economic uh, uh, notion the scale economies will give you that advantage and reduce your cost and your price for taking your content from pakistan to to this corridor will come down now um, bipul on um, multimodal transport um, um, agreement absolutely right we need uh, that kind of agreement and dr kathuria's point on uh, uh, on um, um, the long hanging fruit yes uh, we see the iti dkd corridor itself as the long hanging fruit because the iti dkd corridor is not envisioned as a property for the hosting governments it's not it's not for intra regional trade in sswa but it's also for afghanistan nepal and landlocked central asian countries to access it and it's also for facilitating trade between um, two continents asia and europe and different sub regions within the asian uh, corridor so there's a large connectivity which this links and the low hanging fruit is the is the up and running of the trunk corridor itself so the mou between host nations to have trial runs along the iti dkd corridor and see what the benefits are that itself will 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 you know uh, generate the so the security one last point on the security concerns raised yes that is also very important and with the kind of technology that we have that is why i referred to the eatl project and escap has uh, drawn considerably from that experience eatl was a massive project running in three phases over so many years facilitating transport between um, um west asia east uh, eastern europe and uh, uh, northern asia so Uh, between europe and caucasus their security was a huge concern there but they all came with it modern technology that n number of different um, you know uh, f- technological solutions available for um, overcoming such shortcomings so that's their examples are there for your question which uh, i let i let you know that uh, there is a re- regular railway services between amritsar and lahore and i know at uh, in pakistan side there is no scanning system for the railways and uh, the railway comes from lahore railway station to amritsar railway station and it's carrying the mostly the break bulk car and is a reg- regular service every day uh, uh, yes uh, nishal's question i forgot sorry uh, what what was the biggest challenge and i th- i think ambassador there made a, a good point that sometimes you need to get the security people on board because this we I, I was then working in the Federal Board of Revenue and kind of moved this proposal to have Pakistan become a member of this. And uh, we, we consulted the relevant communication ministry, commerce ministry, and in the cabinet we explained and they were all for it and, and gone through. And then subsequently we realized that Ministry of Foreign Affairs says we were not consulted and then the security guys. So that was the, the, the big, big challenge. So we have still not been able to get over it. Now I think uh, eventually uh, we got these clearances from you know, whoever, the foreign office is now on board and these people are not on board after you know, it's taken. But it should have been done pre rather than uh, post. I think that was a big problem. But uh, you know, this in, in TIR, Amr is right, you know, that it, it, it was stuck. But then there are flexibilities within the system. For example, as I said, all these ECO countries are operating, so they allow local flexibilities and local views and, and things like that. So, okay. um, thank you very much. I think that has been a very interesting session, and uh, it's, it's actually a session well worth almost a half a day, if not more. Um, I'll just make some very quick concluding remarks uh, and uh, share some things <coughs> which I hope will be left as a perspective with all of you. Uh, let me first go back to a conversation which I had uh, very briefly at Yawar Ali Saab's um, function with the Railway Minister of Pakistan. This was last year. And uh, we were just chatting very casually and he made a very, um, very uh, pertinent remark 
And he said that, you know, Arvind, um, if you really ask me, my personal view is that if I need to get Pakistan Railway going, I need to make sure that there is a transit arrangement mechanism which allows my railways to earn the large revenue that I will earn from this transit between India and the rest of uh, Central Asia and beyond. And I, I sort of, uh, and he asked me, he says, are you people talking about this? And I said, sir, you're very futuristic because right now we are only talking on a bilateral basis and we're not looking at joining the dots on the interregional basis at the official level. Uh, so he, he said that, you know, eventually that's the way to go because uh, that's the way the revenues will grow for everybody. That's the way we will move a lot of traffic uh, rather than trying to do it by a circumventious route. And it's a thought process I think he left as a seed in my mind. And when I came back, uh, besides just the bilateral trade dialogue aspect, I started thinking about this a little bit more because of his nudging. And that's when I caught up with ESCAP, and with ESCAP, then they built this thought process even further for me. And they said, you know, uh, everybody talks about the need for pouring in money for infrastructure to get this railway network going, etc. But if you look at it, and it has come out into this discussion, uh, right from Istanbul, Tehran, Islamabad, Lahore, it already exists. However, there is not enough traffic to really make it a kind of a system of supply creating its own demand. And therefore the demand for these services don't really work so well because that volume that you need to bring, the missing piece of the puzzle has to be India's exports and imports that get linked into the system. Now India is a two trillion dollar economy and its exports and imports itself are close to $800 billion and will, I think in another three, four years, become a trillion dollar of exports. Just imagine if a small fraction of that, which is going to the circumventous routes, is able to go by the direct logical routes that exist and can be just joined, how much of a transit royalty payments will be generated? I think that's, that's the key part which ESCAP actually completed the puzzle for me by saying that Lahore and Amritsar are already existing and Lahore, Islamabad and further to the entire Iran and Asia exists uh, up till Turkey etc and beyond. So logically if you are able to put this elephant in the room which is security out of the way by some mechanism uh, which uh, Manzoor Sa very, very uh, cogently has argued that one should not be discussing this without keeping them in the loop because if you do it, then they come later and they say, no, you never consulted us. I think that's the second part of the lesson that we, we are getting out of the session. So we need, to, we need to try and bring those actors also into this thought process. And then while addressing security concerns, move the logical way that it should move. <laughs> now, there are various frameworks by which this can be done. One, as Nisha talked about the TIR, Manzur Sahib talked about TIR. There is the other, which is the, the SARC Railway Services Agreement and the SARC Road <coughs> Transport Agreement. They're right. In the Kathmandu Summit, it was actually expected that since at the technical levels, the job had been done, uh, there will be a signing of this agreement. Uh, Unfortunately, there was a glitch because I think the Pakistan side largely may have had these uh, loops not completed at their level between the coordinating agencies. Uh, so it was not signed at that point of time. Fortunately, the, the trade energy agreement got signed and that's another connectivity which is very vital to the subcontinent. Uh, but I do hope that in the near future, uh, we see both TIR moving and we also see this SAC uh, trade uh, the SAC railway services and the road agreements moving uh, to answer one of the questions from the audience if it is not working at the SAC level can we do it sub-regionally I think that thought process has already started and in fact the thought process has started by saying if possible sub-regional if not even bilateral so that's the thought process and there are discussions going on Already with Nepal, India, there's a bilateral now transport agreement. 
The more we do that, as uh, Mohammed Angarsab said, if you can just drive a car across, both for travel and tourism, and you come back, there's a huge, huge economic potential that's building up in the subcontinent. So the whole theme has been about seamless borders. Um, some part of it, I think, we will uh, hopefully also learn, as Manzoor Saab said, to do it unilaterally uh, without looking at strict reciprocity because I think ultimately my experience teaches me that's also part of the way to go. Uh, too, too much of all these negotiations and equal parity, etc., leads to uh, much longer time frames. And, and ultimately, it's in the good of the region, even if we get somehow the goods and services and people moving. Um, one thought process which, again, ESCAP built in, and I want to leave it with this distinguished audience, was that simply uh, the fact that India's energy requirements for liquid natrified uh, LNG uh, for <coughs> petroleum products is so large uh, that even if a part of what we are importing from Iran comes in through the rail network system, again, there are large volumes and large royalty payments that are available. Among the low-hanging fruits that uh, Sanjay asked about, uh, I, I think uh, in the stakeholder consultation that was done in uh, Amritsar regarding bilateral India-Pakistan trade, a very simple uh, issue that cropped up was that while there is a railway interchange that is happening between India and Pakistan, somehow the two railway ministries are not able to communicate to the business community a regular schedule. So that's one of the lowest hanging fruits, in fact. Even if the business persons knew that, yes, every Monday, or maybe every Monday and Friday, or maybe every Monday and Wednesday, or whatever dates, a train shall run with so many uh, capacity, automatically the bookings will shift from the more expensive road system back to the rail system, which is far more energy efficient. So that's, that's really one of the lowest hanging fruits that the two railway ministries just need to bring in a certainty about the day it will operate rather than keeping up the stakeholders hanging, uh, saying that we'll let you know when the bogies are available. So the poor guys have to warehouse it, pick up the inventory cost, keep it on the trucks, and then keep waiting. And then they say, damn it all, we'll take it by road. So, so I, think, I think that's one of the lowest hanging fruits on a bilateral basis that the two countries need to do to go back to a regular interchange schedule. Um, you know, when I, when I started my civil service, I was extremely impressed with this very wonderful book by Lester Brown, and it was aptly titled World Without Borders. And um, uh, it was a book that talked about how many ways the world benefits if it's able to break down these borders and make them irrelevant. And Based upon that, I kept seeing the theme getting uh, expounded in my present career of the Commerce Ministry by seeing the way ASEAN progressed with its seamless borders and seamless connectivity. And I think ASEAN then became the model uh, for us to start thinking in the subcontinent that if they can, we can. And I'll just leave you with two quick slogans. The Nike one, which I have learned in my career, just do it. So, so, so whenever we get a chance uh, at any particular level to be able to agree, even to an incremental amount, let's just do it. And the final one is, yes, we can. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can we start? Uh, you can carry your cups to your tables. And before we start, <clears throat> we thought we will share with you the magic of technology. 
as produced by the largest search engine in the world uh, to trying to bring our two people closer together. So uh, may I request that video to be played, please? Ye main, ye Yusuf. Lamodia yaar si mera. Laur mein hum aare kar ke samne ek bada baat tha. Us baat ka gate baba adam ke zamane. Roj sham ko amne ma patange udani. Can you switch off the light? Aur uske baad ja ke Yusuf ke dukaan se jazariya chura ke khani. Jazariya? Aur mera saab namaste. Aur mera saab namaste. Meri poti Mumbai wali. Aur bate kya chal hai? दादाजन दिल्ली से किसी की कॉल है हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदीप जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों जजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन में की तंग गले फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मिट्टी चोरी गांठ ले के बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था पार्टिशन के वक्त तो रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए यूसुफ जी बड़ी याद आती है कागजों की कश्तियों में डूब रहता झाकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहता वो भी क्या दौर था मन पे न जोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था previous session on 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 transport links on physical links uh, here we are going to talk about telecommunication links between the two countries and and as you know uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, between india and pakistan when you talk about telecommunications networks is that roaming is not permitted uh, and whenever we go to each other's country we have to get a local sim a local address look at a local person to help us getting the sim and that is something that uh, could possibly be done uh, fairly quickly and the operators are keen to do it but it's the policy environment that needs to be nudged a little bit to allow uh, roaming you know when you think of india 
uh, not as a single country, but as a country with 23, I think, different uh, service areas. The roaming between them, when you know, mobile began to be rolled out in India, uh, roaming between states or between circles used to be fairly high, pretty expensive. But over time, roaming charges have come down significantly due to the competition and some, somebody would say excessive competition within the Indian market. But uh, it's happened over time. And one of the greatest things about, or the biggest impacts of telecom networks uh, in India, and I dare say in Pakistan as well, has been the huge impact, the huge spillover effects that it's had on other uh, industries, other sectors, the kinds of efficiencies it generates and the kinds of inefficiencies it eradicates or eliminates. And uh, just as we were saying in the previous session that you know, better transport links will reduce costs, make trade more efficient, the same thing applies for this intangible kind of network, uh, which is uh, the telecommunications network. Uh, we can drive, th this network can drive efficiencies, reduce uh, transactions costs, etc. So this is one of the things that is obvious. The other thing uh, which has been discussed at the level of the SARC is how do you try and get those prices, at least within the SARC, uh, lower enough so that uh, volume and traffic uh, can increase. As you know today, telecom pricing is no longer determined by distance. Those who operated in India in the 1980s would know 0 to 50 kilometers, this is your charge, 50 to 100 kilometers, this is your charge, 100 to 200, 200 to 500, and so on and so forth. And um, the charges were based on distance. And very soon, as fiber became cheaper, uh, as uh, fiber began to carry a lot of traffic, uh, and, and you know, the amount of traffic was no, no longer a consideration, we had this phenomenon in telecom which is called the death of, death of distance. And so pricing is no longer determined by whether you're calling to Nepal or whether you're calling to Pakistan or whether you're calling to the United States. It's more a, a, a function of the amount, the volume of traffic. And I believe uh, to a large extent the volume of traffic has been restrained. There is a lot of community of interest both between India and Pakistan that will enable uh, given uh, 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 the right to congenial policy environment, uh, that prices will be driven low by greater volume. But uh, we need a combination of both uh, a benign or a congenial policy environment as well as competition within uh, the countries. So. Uh